My disability came as a result of spiritual attack. I became crippled when I was eight years. My elder sister was coming back from school. When they were coming back from school, everybody would like to rush out to meet their siblings on my own way of running out to meet my elder sister. I fell down and that is how I lost my legs. I became crippled. Nigeria's greatest resource has always been its people. Vibrant, culturally diverse, resilient and energetic. Esther lives in Port Harcourt, the capital of River State in Nigeria. She's one of over 10 million Nigerian women who have one form of disability or the other. At first, it wasn't easy to live with disability. At least, I am a computer literate. I worked as a computer instructor for years. But the discrimination is too much. Someone will know actually that the person that is working in this office is a wheelchair user. And when he comes into the office, he will be like, who leads out this environment? Who is using a bicycle in this office? And he won't even care if he's killing your spirit or not. He'll be saying it to your hearing. Normally, I enter the office with my wheelchair. But this day, my boss came to the office and was like, and it was rainy season. Why did you dirty this environment? And you know it truly that this is rainy season. You shouldn't come into the office with your wheelchair. I mean, I should crawl? You mean I should crawl into the, the office, boss? I should leave my wheelchair outside and crawl into the office. And he said, if you cannot leave your wheelchair outside, don't come here again. Esther and millions of women like her exist at the intersection between gender-based discrimination and discrimination against people with disabilities. These are the other women. want to be kept down, Esther has found renewed purpose in competitive weightlifting, a sport in which she has found both friendship and accolades. A friend met me and was like, where do you work? I was very tiny then, said I work as a, an instructor. And she said, do you know we have what we call para sports? So I explain. So she did explain to me. So I went in, I saw ladies like me doing it. I even saw, there was a girl, she was very tiny, the way I was then. I said, since this person can do it, why can't I do it? I know I can. So sports has given me a wider experience in life. Sports had made me to understand that there is ability in every disability. And anyhow you are, and anyhow, anywhere you find yourself, that you can make it. these women, it is a devastating double dose of discrimination, especially when they live in extractive communities. This documentary explores how women with disabilities face social and economic exclusion in resource-producing communities, how they push on with resilience, and how we all can take action to build a more inclusive and equitable society. A few miles away in Guara, a community in oil rich Ogoni, also in River State. We meet another woman who is not letting her circumstances hold her back. An insurance handy holder. I also enrolled myself for fashion designing since I could not find a job. So I'm doing my fashion business at Lu Yogwara there. That's what I used to help myself. 
My father is late and my mom is sick. There's nothing I can do. I can't change the situation I find myself. So I keep on moving with the faith that one day God will see me through. So there is a lot of uh, opportunities that I have missed because I'm disabled, yes. The society is not friendly with disabled people at all. There was one time, even the, because I'm a Catholic, the Reverend Sisters came to my house, bring a form for me to fill. After filling the form, after some months, they told my father that they, they sent some money for my scholarship and at the end of the day, we don't know what happened and the scholarship was not given to me. Disability limits women in extractive communities from moving to find better economic opportunities in bigger towns and urban centers. Gift left Guara to find a new life in the city of Bori, but is yet to find the physical and emotional support that she needs here. Like here in Guara, I'm not bragging, but I am one of the best tailors they have. And my people are proud of me. In order to survive, she's forced to make a risky journey every day to and from her village, where she faces less discrimination and more patronage for her business than in Bori. Here in the village, Gift can at least count on getting physical assistance and emotional support from friends and family. I live in Bori. I come all the way from Bori every morning to my shop. After work around 4.30, 5 o'clock, I went back to Bori. I, I, I ran this shop 2018, so it's going four years now. I don't even have a car, so what I use is bike. I bought the bike, they come to my house, pick me, drop me here. And a lot, I'm going through a lot of stress. Sometimes I felt sick and because of the stress, but I have to go because I have no body to lean on and I don't want to beg. Yeah, sometimes they bring work. After seeing the person that is doing the work, they feel like, ah, would this person be able to do my work neatly? So it takes you time to convince them. Sometimes it's the people around that will tell them, yes, you can do it, and trying to convince them. But at the end of the day, when you do the work for them, they will appreciate. In fashion business, you can't compare the city with the village because the, most of our uh, uh, clients here, customers, they are farmers. They are doing nothing. But in the city, you have a working class ladies that will have you as a customer. And when you uh, charge them, they won't complain too much. So you, can, you can never compare the village price to the city. But we are managing. Like Esther, who we met in Port Harcourt, Gift is determined to be independent. She has empowered herself with the skill with which she makes a livelihood. Women with disabilities have been systematically locked out of economic opportunities in extractive communities, yet they continue to push through the barriers and fight for better opportunities for themselves. As we're about to find out, the presence of mineral resources in a community and the conflict that often follows can lead to death and disability, especially for women. This is Biara, another community in Ogoni land. For many years, the oil wells here have been shut down, but the environmental damage persists. And for some, the memories of the conflict that led to the shutdown are still quite fresh. Back in the 1990s, Biara and many towns across Ogoni land were rocked by a bloody crisis. Armed gangs and government forces, allegedly backed by private oil companies, unleashed a wave of violence against local activists and communities. Karololo Kubara is a victim of that conflict, a conflict that she had no part in, which has left her disabled and bereaved. Her only crime, being a woman in a poor, oil-rich community. While Esther and Gift have found a support system in sports and family respectively, Karololo has been deprived of her support system by events in her community. <laughs> 
Nadu Bombiara. 1993, we bros. We bros. We We bros. We bros. We bros. We bros. We bros. Bien, Nana. D'accord, mais bague, quoi. Bamba, il a l'air d'accord. Bon, dimengue, bon, il a l'air d'accord. 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 Il a some in a top be share. Share time by bundle, banana bundle. Banam don't bam and I'm not a bam bam, Miss Evacara bundle. And can I find my teaching hospital? Can by it about a full lolly? Can you have a quick top be a dot tongue be? And be a nana. Hm, say I told me about calling old tongue with a nosy. A minute didn't worry me about him by time fair, but all time fair. So, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing it. 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 i I was able to get a She has lost her farm, her limb, her son, her sense of safety, and is now trapped in a daily struggle to hold on to her dignity. Carlo Lo's ordeal is just one example of the direct causal link that exists between extractive activities and the occurrence of disability, particularly among women. Even where there is no violent conflict, women are still vulnerable to the dangerous working conditions and lack of health and safety standards in the extractive industries. To fully understand this, we took a tour across different parts of the country where mining and extractive activities take place. From the rough terrain of Guagualada, Niger, Zamfara, Plateau, Eboi, to the pits in Oshun and Ogun states. We have come to Eboi state in Nigeria's southeast to meet two women who are facing a familiar struggle. Eboi has rich deposits of zinc, gypsum, granite, marble, limestone, salt, and clay. But opportunities are few, and poverty abounds. Desperate and without options, the women take up the back-breaking tasks they are assigned in quarries where explosives are used and safety standards are almost non-existent. My name is Ezekiel Amarachi Ekwe. Before the incident that took place on me, took place on me, was when I was walking to Nife at Crossstone. The place looks like a company. It's a company. So women are much than men. What women are doing there is just to break the stone. And the men are removing it out from the pit. So women should go and carry it and be breaking. I didn't know that there was a shot of stone that was about of, uh, to break. Immediately, as I entered to remove out the working materials, 
suddenly the incident took place. So I didn't know what to do. I thought that is kidnappers or people that come to steal. I didn't know that it's a shot of stone. When I was, I want to turn back to run out from the place, I hit my leg on stone. I could not be able to stand up again. One of my elders from the, this church that was coming on that morning, he saw me there. He was the one that helped me. We didn't know that they want to blow off a stone because they didn't tell us that they want to blow out a stone. So when I was going to bring out the working materials, when I had it, for me to turn back was a hard process for me. Suddenly, I just had the accident. So immediately, I was at home on the sick bed for three, and some weeks, three months and some weeks. That's so my parents asked me not to go there again. I cannot run far, but I can do some works. The man that I had a counter with in this church, he has been helping me since then till now. Yes, nobody has come to help me except the man. Everyone yeah <laughs> The company that owns the quarry has offered no help to Amarachi and Ijoma. And so what could have been a treatable injury has now become a permanent disability. What, if anything, can the young girls in extractive communities look forward to? Are they doomed to risk life and limb working in the quarries without any protection like Amarachi and Ijoma. Will these young girls end up as the other women? This is Abuja, Nigeria's capital city. reserves in decline, Nigeria's mining industry might be one of the keys to its economic security. But considering what we've seen in places like the quarries of Eboni, where will this leave women? We put these questions to Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Mines and Steel Development, architect Olami Lekon Adebite. When I came into office, um, uh, we've seen work that's been done previously, but uh, realize that there's much to be done, there's still a lot of gap. So we chose to focus uh, through, uh, there's this body, it's called Women in Mining. So what we decided to do was to support that body fully, you know, to achieve its aims. And that is to integrate women properly, to give them proper recognition in, uh, in the extractive sector, especially as it relates to mining. The first thing we did was to support them uh, before then, they didn't have any functional office to work from. So it was mostly ad hoc from the private premises of the uh, president of WIN, as women in mining, uh, WIM, 
where they were working. So we got an office for them and of course furnished that. And um, we decided that uh, we we're going to have this um, affirmative act, you know, to deliberately include women in all of our programs. Uh, there is this issue of, uh, we have a fund, you know, where we'll give to minors uh, uh, at very low interest rates, 5% per annum. It's probably the lowest you can get around there now in this country. And there's a long tenor, 15 to 25 years. We decided that we'll prioritize that this money, you know, should be given to women more even than uh, men. So when women apply, uh, I don't know, I don't want to be condescending, uh, but we look more favorably on women. Uh, as, per, as you yourself have said, uh, research has shown that women uh, pay back better when they take a loan than men. Uh, I've been a witness to that myself. Uh, I work for the state government sometime and we had that issue. Uh, we have about 100% payback by women. Uh, men were lagging at about 65-70% uh, payback. So, we also encourage that that fund should be targeted at women. In spite of these efforts, there is an obvious lack of programs targeted specifically at women with disabilities in the mining sector. So what we've done is, it's not just an initiative from the minister's office, because uh, like you said, we always recognize the transcendent nature of political office. You're here, you know, and then you're moving on maybe after four years, uh, in some cases, eight years. So whatever initiative that's initiated by my office, we try to carry everybody in the ministry alone. It becomes a culture within the ministry. So it's not something that easily that you can truncate. When the next person comes, it, be, it meets that culture. And of course, I assume that whoever that is, whatever is good and is working, we want to continue as well. So it's not just an initiative in office. As you come, a culture in the ministry that is now, uh, uh, it's penetrated down. So everybody in the ministry is conscious of that fact. That is what we need to do. We need to recognize the women and all that. So I think without uh, uh, re writing that down, you know, as a policy and all that, it, it, it's even better when it has become a culture of the ministry and everybody's aware of it, rather something that's just written on paper that can be easily discarded. So that, that's, I believe, uh, will work better uh, for the sector. Still in Abuja, we've come to see a man with a unique understanding of the difficulties faced by persons with disabilities and the efforts the federal government is taking to address those challenges. You know, disability, there are hidden disability. So we try to identify these people, their need, and they have to care for them. I tell you, we are ready to change the narrative of passing with disability. Why do I hear you visible in Nigeria? A person with disability naturally faces many, many challenges. But again, it differs from individual to individual. For me, I would say major challenges. People see us as never do well. They give, make us have a low self-esteem. Go to an office looking for information. And the next thing the man did was to bring out 20 naira to give me. As if I have come to bed. And what is that? Do I carry the disability on my forehead? You see? Society says I'll never do well. People in car in capable of anything. It starts right from the family. Where once a person with disability, you are relegated to the background. I want to make another example from my own experience in the family structure. On a Christmas day, we gather brother, sister, cousin. And one of us, what to do, came. Okay, I asked to all that, what we want to drink. Everybody, Name, 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 what they want to drink, whatever, bring this beer, soft drink, whatever. So when it comes to me, I said I will drink, you start. You know the response to me, <laughs> you that is sick. How will you drink? 
to chat. Eh? Because I'm there, I can't drink that. Or because somebody is having the that they cannot drink is that. We are human first. Society should us at that. You see, in the press, major they call us person living with disability. My definition is not a terminal disease. So why, why, why are you calling me person living with disability? The idea, the word, the proper word would be person with disability, not person living with disability. A society don't give us a chance, especially in Nigeria. But I know that with awareness, changes are possible. But then it will take time, and that is why we are here. We thank God that we have a commitment now. We work towards changing the societal perception of person with disability to the better. The current child person of disability commission just name. My don't mind my pronunciation. Kenan Mizim. She is wish her. Today, she is the person of Plato State Disability Commission. Commission. We also have Kanen Kwandi Adebayo, deaf woman. Left just travel to US, study, university, college university, come back to Nigeria. And today, she is a lecturer in the University of Jeff. So, most of the persons with disability try to overcome the burden of disability. Yes. Don't work. But what we want is that society should understand our need and where possible, I say, to make us live an honor and life that is enviable, not condemn us or discriminate against us on the basis of our disability. Yes, persons with disability can do. In the last couple of years, Nigeria's federal government has shown a lot more interest in tapping into and boosting the potential of the mining sector. However, what we find interesting about this is that two of the first gold refining licenses issued in the country were to Kian Smith Mining and Dukia Gold, both companies led by women, evidence of the capacity of women to transform an industry. We are in Oshobo, the capital of Oshun State in southwest Nigeria. Very unassuming when conversations are had about Nigeria's southwest. From here, we make a two hour drive out of the city center to the forests in Jagudube, along the Jesha axis of Elisha. Beneath these vast forest floors lies an enormous deposit of value, gold. Like several other locations we've been to, the Jagudube forest is dreadful and difficult to navigate. Working in the gold mines of Jagudube is physically demanding and even dangerous. Oluwaya Misi Adeshola Obadofi is one of a handful of women who have been issued gold mining licenses by the Federal Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. In spite of the challenges of funding and the lack of technology, Oluwayamisi is not wasting any time in putting her mining license to use. The name of my company is Bimart Gold International Limited and it's about five years old now. For now, we only mine gold. The skill and the abilities in mining in Nigeria for you to mine or for you to be a miner, the first step is for you to get a geologist that has to check the land and see the type of mineral that is there. And when it comes to mining, mining involves a lot of money that the people that can invest are those that has the money to do mining. Without, mine, without money, you cannot do mining successfully. As you can see here, that's why the fact that we have a land sense. We are still operating artisanal miners. We are still using laborers to work. But we still have a land sense 
that allow us to use the technology to mine. For mining now, we have uh, like 30% women, why 70% men? It's not as if women cannot really go into mining, but it has to be a mechanized mining. Women in this area can only pan. Panning is just to remove gold from the sand that is being packed. Although Ayami is sympathetic to their plight, yet she acknowledges that women with disabilities who want to be employed in a mine like hers will face obvious barriers. People living with disability, for them to come and work in this type of area, it will be a little bit difficult. So we don't really have people with that that comes here. Mining generally, hardly can use somebody with disability in a mining site like this. First thing, when they come, when any women come, what we look at is their, to assess their physical abilities. It's not even signalization this time around. But you know, if somebody is coming and you can now see that the person, in case there's any danger, he, won't be, he or she will not be able to, to run or to take cover. You, you find it difficult to employ that type of person. So we don't look at them as if uh, there's a stigma being attached to them as if these people, because they are living the way they are living, then we can't employ them. No, no, no. The physical thing to, the, the first thing we do is to assess them physically and see how fit they are to be able to work with us. Women with disabilities, as we have been talking about them, they have access to social life too in the community. They have access, but it is being limited because of the stigmatization and every other thing that is being, they are being tagged with. Amidst the clear lack of policies and interventions specifically focused on women with disabilities, there are a number of non-governmental organizations working to dismantle these barriers and make the mining industry more inclusive for women and women with disabilities. We are in Plateau State to meet Emily, the Secretary of Women in Mining and the founder of Ziva, an NGO. Both organizations have a mission to facilitate greater access for women to the opportunities that exist within the mining sector. My name is Emily Ofodili. I am a geologist and ASM consultant. I've been in the mining sector for the past 10 years. And having worked in the mining communities, I saw that a lot of times the women are not really involved in the space. Even those who are involved, they have no access to information, they have no access to education, they have no access to the technology being involved in mining. And that was where we bore um, from that space, we bore um, Ziva Community Initiative. Currently, I'm the executive director and I'm working presently in Plateau State. And we are working with four communities, which is Panshin and Bokos, Basa and Just East. Having gone around before now, we saw that a lot of times the women in the gemstone sector in Plateau State, these gemstones are found in their communities, but yet they don't know what to do with it. They don't even know the value of it, of the gemstones they have in their hands. For instance, the women in the garnet um, sector, they don't even know how to trade it, how to sell it. To include not just the women, we saw that there were some people who were very special that needed to be trained and we found some who are really interested, some who are trading bead making but want to have the education for making jewellery. And so now we started a training for dwellers. One, aside being a woman, I have seen that a lot of times the women are most vulnerable. For instance, most of them work in the processing, in the beneficiation of minerals, but they are not solely involved in the extraction of the uh, minerals from the earth. Working with these communities, I found that the women are really interested. A lot of times they stand by to just pick from anything that remains from what the men have done. 
and they go about doing that. And you see that they tell you that from the money that they get, they're able to train their children in school. For instance, in Niger State, I have a woman who said from um, working as a set training of um, gold from the areas where they work, they've been able to help their children get education, also put their children through tailoring school, and now they're trying to gather money through their cooperative to buy machineries for their children. So that's where the interest really come from, that when we empower those women, when we build their capacity, they can do much more than what they are doing. And in that same space, we just don't want to have just the women. We have the special women who are the physical um, challenge women, women. And we are also including them in what we're doing because they are not left out. Some of them are orphans, some of them have husbands, and some of them are really interested to contribute something to their household, not just for them to be looked as if they are beggars or looking for help or people to you know, have that pity kind of thing with them. Some of them are really very bold. You know, so that's one of the things we really want to do to make them feel that in, in the disability, there's ability to do more. Ziva's work involves going to the communities to meet with, hear from, and sensitize the women. Emily's work and that of organizations like Women in Mining have become the trunk that bears the weight of the different branches connecting women with disabilities in diverse extractive communities across the country. What we also had to do was to go out and identify them. Um, we have someone who was really interested and said, oh, I have friends of mine who are really interested. They have these things, these um, stones mined in their communities, but they don't know how to go about it. They have no um, knowledge, they have no um, information on what they can do with them. And what did we do? From meeting one person, we were able to reach out to so many of them, and so many are still calling us to say, I'm interested, I want to do this. I'm interested to be part, to be able to make jewelry for myself, jewelry to sell to other people. Most mining in Nigeria is undertaken by artisanal and small-scale miners using manual labor and minimal machinery. There is an urgent need for the government to drive private mining companies to adopt advanced technology in the mines so that women with disabilities can have more opportunities in the sector. In the meantime, organizations like Ziva continue the work of giving women access to the economic opportunities that the mines present.
Kos, the Plateau State capital. One woman who is taking the lessons learned from Ziva and using it to empower herself and others is Naya Solomon. Even though her disability prevents her from working in the tin mines at the moment, Naya is determined to create opportunities for herself and others by looking further down the value chain and making jewelry. I came about Ziva to a friend of mine. She introduced me to the group and I was interested. I then I joined the group so that it will make me to also invest in women around me. I would like to use the resources mined from here for making jewelry and other things that will help the women to also be among the society because I, it's as if women are left behind in everything in the society. So we want the women too to be also part of the program so that we enjoy it very well. So that even us, that they are mining from us, we enjoy from the community. Because you can't do things that you lost. You do things that you gain from it. If you're going into anything that will not make any advantage to your life, you know that all that's a failure. So I'll use it to make sure that I profit from it. Like most women, Maya's friendships and relationships are important to her. But once again, society's perception of women with disabilities poses a challenge. If I'm giving an assignment to do, maybe in the uh, office or anywhere, they'll say, ah, this one, can she do this? Can she do that? Can she do that? And most especially with our peer groups, friends, sometimes we face some challenges like that. If you're going out with a male friend, if you see you, ah, this is the kind of thing you're going out with, they address us and they look inferior upon us. Mm. So those are the challenges we face with some people. Nollywood, Nigeria's film industry, is a powerful cultural influence around the world. But it is also known for its negative portrayals of women, and women with disabilities in particular. The way the Nollywood shows or puts the picture of physically challenged people in films, I want to advise that they should put the good parts that the physical challenge do, do on films and they should not play the bad side of the people living with disability. Like among us, we do crack jokes, we call each other names and all this and all that, but we want the society to avoid calling harsh names on persons living with disability. Uh, names like the blind person, uh, deaf, we use words like the words that are impressive, words like visually impaired and uh, uh, hairy impaired, physically challenged. We have the albinos and others. We need names that at least we encourage us. We don't need names like the blind man. We don't need names like uh, that deaf and other things like that. But are the criticisms fair? Is our media and entertainment industry abusing its influence and fueling discrimination? Or is it simply holding up a mirror to a society that is not as inclusive as it ought to be? We gathered some of the leading lights in media and Nollywood to discuss the issue and find some answers. It's a simple request, but will society and Nollywood listen? Only time will tell. But the power that the media holds in shifting perceptions and attitudes is undeniable. In our world today, generally, in this uh, certain dispensation we are today, they have created more awareness to people on how to go about disabled people. So the kind of challenges I face from people now is so much as that of then. We do contests for election, 
we do, they do give us posts. I was one time a special advisor to the governor on disability. So we are given chances and everything. So there is nothing that I will go out to voice out to my people, to my groups, because we have political parties I'm based in another political party and the other people are based in other political parties. But to my own group, I know we are all doing well with our uh, groups. Still in Jos, we meet Habiba and Hawa. Two women also undergoing training with Ziva's community initiative. to <laughs> Sabida ina karatu kuma za a zo a katse a ce an samu mai gyara da a yanke ni a ji a yi gyara zo in dade in Najiya naji sauki kuma a dada komawa a ce an samu wani mai gyara haka dai akai tai haka akai tai to karatu dai an yi shi dai kawai kadan kadan in san dangai sanan idan gaskiya ba zami amfani da shi sabida abun adam mata ne kuma sana a tana da kyau ko na miji yana yi ya zama mace yana tana yi saboda akwai wani taimako da zai tashi ba na miji zaka nema ya taimaka maka ba mace yar uwanka zaka nema ta taimaka maka ko dan wani amfani da kai haka eh idan na iya in san dan gaskiya sai na san ta kudin shi dan gaskiya kai na kudin maka san tare da kamuna ya dan dan ga taimako mama na eh ina son fakanta as we have seen in Plateau, CSOs around the country are doing the difficult but necessary work of gaining insights into the perceptions towards and challenges faced by women with disabilities at the grassroots level. The most effective interventions are achieved when CSOs and other stakeholders turn the insights they have gained in the field into evidence-based lobbying of government and the private sector so that inclusive laws and policies can be made for the benefit of women with disabilities. In Nigeria, this part of Africa, there is this widely held belief that women are not supposed to participate in certain activities in the communities. If you're a person with disabilities, you are already discriminated by tradition because there is this belief that an average person with disability lost his or her limb by reason of the gods being against the family or against the individual. Therefore, the society stigmatizes such individual with disability. And if a, a, a girl with disability, it means that it's a multiple layers of stigma. Stigma, discrimination, you know, isolation by reason that you're a woman, two, that you have disability. As such, the value of such individual with disability is reduced to minus zero. So, we've discovered that access, inclusion, participation is minus zero. The struggle for survival, the struggle to participate is more difficult by reason of your gender being female. That is the situation we have here. As, as CCD, CCD is a, is a national organization that focuses both rural, urban, and major cities. Uh, we did a project in Akwaibom State where we engage 
people with disabilities in resource producing communities, building their capacities on disability rights and activities. Also engaging them for them to be advocates to promote the prohibition of all forms of discrimination on the grounds of disabilities. Part of the things we do here at CCD is to build capacities. Uh, it's also to also to encourage people with disabilities to participate in political activities. Uh, these are some of the things that we've successfully done in some of these communities and uh, it's bearing the very result. Uh, most of them are now coming out, finding entry points, participating in their community events and demanding for inclusion and removal of barriers that hinder them from participating in the world based with others. You know, beyond attitudinal barrier, there's also environmental barrier, there's also institutional barrier. Those norms, those values that undermines the existence and dignity of women with disabilities, these are the things we leave their mind up for them to appreciate and speak to ensure that they are removed. Recognizing that no one is immune from getting disability including the opinion leaders or gatekeepers within the communities. This is Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital, a metropolis with its own unique energy. Adenike is the Senior Special Advisor on Persons with Disabilities to the Governor of Lagos State. Adenike's advocacy for persons with disabilities comes from a very personal place. Uh, I can't remember how many years now, but 2005, I had a domestic fall in the house. And from that domestic fall, I had to be taken to the hospital, one hospital, second hospital, and eventually found myself at the University College Hospital in Ibadan by 2006, early 2006. In that space, I had um, fought for my life because cancer was ravaging my body. And um, what it was, was the diagnosis, osteogenic sarcoma, simply put cancer in the bone. Um, there really isn't a you know, cure to cancer as such. So one of the first things that you have to do is to amputate or cut off. And because it was my leg, the most ideal thing to do to try to preserve my life, um, hoping to add chemotherapy was an amputation to be done. And, you know, that's what happened. The amputation was done on the 4th of February, 2006, which also happened to be the World Cancer Day. So, yeah. So um, I am the SSA to the Lagos State Governor, um, Babajide Ulusrala Somulu, on persons with disability. And um, SSA, simply put, is Senior Special Advisor. Advisor is the key part. And what advising means is just to give advice, just to give opinion, just to guide on several topics. And in this instance, is on issues of disability. Um, yes, I have the experiential knowledge. Yes, I have a few um, field knowledge. And um, personally, now equipping myself with the book knowledge as it were but um, in all of that time and in all of that space I have found out that one of the best things to do is to continue to interact with people in my space and my role predominantly is to go out interact see um, assess you know what should be done what can be done who to speak with who to chastise who to penalize who to call out and um, all in a bit to creating not just an inclusive society but also a diverse Lagos state because Lagos is like the commercial hub of the entire country. Everybody wants to come to Lagos and because of that we now see a growing number of persons living with disability and not just disability physical like myself. We also have people with a mental retardation and this is a thing we never used to know. So my role now is to say Mr. Governor I'm sure you know that we now have a high number of people who are living with learning disability, people who are living with speech disability, you know, or having communication issues, or people who are living with numerical disability, something that growing up we used to call Uludu. And, you know, people would make fun of such people. Now we see that some of them must have lived with dyslexia, something that we never knew. So, yeah. 
The Lagos State Special People's Laws um, <laughs> came into being in 2011 under the Fashion Administration. And prior to 2011, when it came into law, a lot of work had been put, a lot of work had gone into it. People who had preceded, people who are still active in this disability discourse space, people who have interests as stakeholders, whether they are carers, they are parents, they provide one service or the other. These people for so many years have been talking about um, why it was important for us to have a law that protects, provides for, and clearly spells out you know, matters that have to do with people with disability. And that's what the Special People's Law has come to do. Um, the general hope and focus of the law is awareness. So it creates awareness that there are these categories of individuals in our society. There are people in our society who, owing to no fault of theirs, are living with various forms of disabilities and we must provide them with optimal resources so that they can live as maximally as their capacities can permit. So we, one would not expect that Lagos State Insurance Cover will cover everything, but if it covers the things that you sh you're sure that you can need in the immediate, I feel like that's actually a starting point and a good place to start. So there's healthcare, there's accessibility, now, which has become one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest issues, you know, that Lagos State Office of Disability Affairs, as well as anybody who lives with disability in Lagos, is still fighting. Why? Because ideally, you would expect that people who are well-traveled, well-exposed, a lot of them even have people living with disability in their families should know better. I don't know about you, I have never seen a person on a wheelchair use, you know, an ATM in this country, never. And that's because we do not think they are worthy. Guess what? They have the financial strength. So for everybody or most people who go to the ATM, except where the you know, um, surface area is leveraged, a lot of them do not even have the ability to go. So every time they go to the machine, they always have to give their cards to security guards. How, for how long? How many of those wheelchairs can get into a banking hall? There was a time that banks, I agree, were you know, targets for arm robberies. That's where, if you remember very well, we started to have those doors in Nigerian banks. Not a problem, but we should have evolved past that years and years afterwards. How does a person who is, whether it is legally blind, total blindness or partial blindness, get into a banking hall or get into a building that doesn't have braille? They always have to ask, sorry, please, am I, have I gotten to? No, these people want to live in, you know, independent lives. And that's one of the things that the law also provides for. Access. You must, you are bound, even in the abroad, for instance, where there are structures and it is impossible for you to erect um, maybe elevators or lifts like we call them. The ideal thing is to still provide the services to anybody living with disability that you can provide outside without the need of going upstairs or whatever it is. How many places do you see? People don't even consider them. How many landlords have you seen allow people living with disability modify their properties to fit them? Simple things like wheelchair. And it's not just everybody always shouts ramp, just the entry part. Bathrooms are not fit for people living with disability. I recently went into a hotel on the island that was the disability room and I was on top of the world. I literally cried because I'm like, oh my God. But guess what? It's so expensive. It's almost a hundred thousand naira per day. So are you saying that a person on a wheelchair cannot, should not, and can, can never aspire to go a hundred thousand? How many people can afford it? So as it concerns the law, if you interact, you know, at the secretariat at Alausa, and you go to, there are several departments and agencies, though closely related, very distinct, and I'll just mention two, the, the you know, sexual violence um, agency, as well as Ministry of um, Women's Affairs, you cannot, go into any of those places, lay for more complaints and your matter will not be picked up. The two people who head those places are actually women. So they connect. A lot of times we put people in places where they do not really connect. You can have pity for me, you can have empathy for me, but you may not be able to connect, say, um, dysmenorrhea, menstrual cramps. As a man, you, know, you might not know, but as a woman who probably has had it, has people who go through it. Once I mention it to you, you know. So there is no special provision as it were. 
But if you go to the Office of Disability Affairs, as a woman living with disability and you're subject to any form of discrimination or abuse because you live with that disability and you have cogent evidence or reason, your matter is, is taken almost immediately. Just present yourself is the basic thing. You should also remember that with um, women, for instance, you know, domestic violence situations, it's a very, very dicey situation. If as a person who is a survivor, you do not want to persecute, you do not want to, you know, push for that. You do not want to, you see all of them come, he beat me, he beat me, he almost killed me. Okay, so what do you want? Do you want us to take it two days, two weeks after you have started, whether you want to start with mediation or you want to file it straight to court? They come and say, I'm no longer interested. Aha. If Lagos can get it right, then perhaps there is hope that change can happen elsewhere. In the meantime, these brave women are finding ways to add value to their lives and society in general. Another activist working to improve the lives of women with disabilities is Lois Auta. Lois is an accomplished advocate for the rights of women with disabilities, and she has some ideas about how the institutional, attitudinal and infrastructural barriers that they face can be dismantled. Women with disabilities are triple jeopardized because they are women, they are women with disabilities and the society is not friendly to her. The barriers and the factors that are stopping her from thriving well. So one of it is a attitudinal barrier institutional barrier and infrastructural barriers. When we say institutional barrier, we're talking about the policies that we have in this country. Yes, we are happy, we are excited about Nigerian Disability Act, but it is sad to know that issues of women with disabilities are not really captured in that act. And so many policies that we have, is it VAP Act? Is it um, um, Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill? And other beautiful policies and laws, issues of women with disabilities are not captured as it should. And when we talk about attitudinal barriers, we see the disability first before the person. We pity women with disabilities instead of empathizing with them. We need to stop that kind of perception. Yeah, we need to see the abilities in women with disabilities before their disabilities, and that's attitudinal. And infrastructural is the ability to go into a building without being assisted. We want to see ramps being constructed at entry and exit points of any building, either an office, a church, a mosque, a hotel, schools, hospitals, everywhere needs to be accessible and inclusive for women and girls with disabilities. So these are the three barriers faced by women. Attitudinal barrier, infrastructural barrier, and institutional barrier. I was saying earlier that um, there are families that have come to the Lagos State Office of Disability Affairs um, and have reported matters. And because they have reported those matters, those cases have been picked up. And there are women with disability who have come and have mentioned one or two instances or three instances, and we have given them, you know, protection, a safety net, a social protection of some sort. I mentioned earlier that the Office of Disability Affairs doesn't work alone. Disability cuts across all ministries. It's in agriculture. It's in health. It's in home affairs. Disability is in tourism. Disability is in housing or land. It's everywhere. So if there's a woman living with disability who shows up and there's abuse of some sort. Whatever the form of abuse it is, financial, physical, mental, psychological, something that, you know, a lot of people, Nigerians, are just coming to grasp because people don't say, oh, wait till they worry, I'm, which one is financial, which one is mental, you know, or you talk about a woman who just had a child living with disability and is suffering postpartum depression, and then family brings her to allow her. 
and they can't explain. You're behind, they just can't come, what's going on? The moment you call your colleague at the Ministry of Health, the person cites her, they already have a fair idea of what she might be going through. Put her on that thorough examination and then they identify that, oh, this person is suffering postpartum depression. Where's her family? We're going to have to take this child from this woman, hand her over to you and we're going to keep her with us until she's in a better space of mind. Women have been helped, but the question is they don't want to come out. And if you don't come out, nobody can help you. So Olu is not going to go into your house because he doesn't even know that you exist. He only knows that you exist when you come to the Lagos State Office of Disability Affairs. You get registered. He knows of your existence. He knows of the peculiarity of your case. In the event that there's an issue and he says, oh, we have not seen this woman. Where is she? Let's give her a follow-up. And then you find out that, oh, wow, something has happened. We've not heard from her. Oh, she's now here. We found out that this and this is what she has been going through. And you couldn't speak up. We have a culture of silence. And because we are trying to break through and break free from the culture of silence, many women who need to be helped are not coming out. And until they come out, the provisions that the law has and what the state you know, has in her disposal, you cannot benefit from. And if you cannot come out and benefit from it, you can't blame the government for not working. The other women are women, fighting hard to live with dignity. In spite of the resilience of these women to make a living for themselves and to be included in the social and economic life of their communities, they continue to face certain barriers and stigma from society. We can support their efforts by helping to strengthen and enforce legislation that outlaws discrimination against women with disabilities, entrenches equity in education, leadership, and employment opportunities in the extractive industries for women with disabilities. For example, by implementing a quota system and pushing for the use of more advanced technology in mines. Great things happen when we all play our part to make sure that the most vulnerable among us have equitable access to opportunities in our communities. Um, I'm single. I don't have a child now, now, but I know I will have my own children. As for a relationship, when I go into a relationship, the family of the guy that I date, they will be against him. Among all the ladies, the one with crutches is the one you choose. So with that, things will turn around and I will withdraw myself. But that, if I want to marry, that will not stop me because I, I have seen a lot of physically challenged ladies that are married happily. But everything is time. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Apart from discrimination that robs them of equal opportunities, there is also social stigma that has deprived them of a healthy love life and relationships. With hopes and dreams, yearning for a better future, we must realize that these so-called other women are indeed women. <laughs>